Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live, brought to you by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football giants. Happy Thursday, everybody. John Schmelk, Matt Sytak with you. We continue our prospect series today. A couple of cool schools from the South with a lot of prospects coming out, so we'll learn about a lot of players today. We're going to have Mickey Plyler, who covers Clemson for 105 FM The Roar in South Carolina at 1 o'clock. But we're going to lead off the show with Gordy Rush, who's – been with us many times over the years talking about LSU products. He's their sideline reporter. Gordy, you got John Schmelk and Matt Sytak up here in East Rutherford, New Jersey. And boy, there are a number of really good players coming out of LSU this year. Yeah, well, I mean, anytime you, you put up, I think, historic numbers offensively, you have a Heisman Trophy winner. Uh, you have a guy, arguably, that should have won the Belitnikoff Award. Um, just some phenomenal talent. Uh, this year in Baton Rouge, and, and you know, ironically, it was a down year for LSU defensively <laughs> that traditionally has had a lot of good defenses. True. I think that was a good thing for the offense because we were we had some Big Twelve scores this year <laughs> in the SEC. They had, and you know they had to in order to stay in some of those games. And let's start with that guy that you thought should have been the Blitnikoff winner this year. And by the way, no shame in it. There were a lot of really good wide receivers in, in college right. football this year. And that's Malik Neighbors, a name that has been connected to the New York Giants a ton with the sixth overall pick. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get right to the off-the-field stuff first here, Gordy, because, and I want to be clear, I have not heard this about Malik Neighbors, but it's a question that I'm, I'm going to have just because of the position, and the Giants have had sure. some experience with LSU wide receivers and Ole Beckham Jr. Is Malik Neighbors a quote-unquote diva wide receiver, or is he more of your blue-collar type uh, that, frankly, we've seen more of enter the league over the last couple of years? No, he's a blue collar kid. No, he's a you know a blue collar kid from the, you know the the part of the state the the neighbors is from, um, uh, you know not knocking Odell. Odell was from Isidore Newman High School in uptown New Orleans where the Mannings went and um, a little, little bit different atmosphere and, and you know no, Odell even at LSU you know Odell kind of personality evolved after he he left LSU but not neighbors neighbors is a He's a blue collar kid. He works hard. Had a, pro, a phenomenal pro day. Um, you know, came in with a very talented receiver class with Keishon Boutte, who was with the the Patriots last year. Yeah. And and really, the last two years, uh, I think, has really evolved nicely. And uh, just had a phenomenal season this year. I think when Boutte left last year, and they were able to move neighbors around, and they were able to put him in the slot. And, and, and get it in some matchup situations. He played multiple spots this year. He, he really did excel. Yeah, so you kind of touched on what my uh, first question was going to be about Malik in that this past season especially, he found success, you know, no matter where he lined up on the field, as X receiver, you know, in the slot, wherever. But where do you think in the, at the next level, where do you think he will find the most success? What, why, what wide receiver spot? Well, you know, I think it depends what you have, you know, and, and specifically, you know, with, with um, you know, what's what's on the Giants roster if he winds up with the Giants. But, uh, you know, let, let me let me take a step back and let's bring Brian Thomas Jr. into the conversation because he's a pure X receiver and he's got first round grades as well. Uh, was a basketball player in high school from the Baton Rouge area. Saw him playing. Just a uh, big kid, another four three forty guy. Got hops and, uh, you know, when, when you had him on the field. Um, you have to give safety help. And so in that case, it enabled neighbors to do a lot of things. And um, a lot of times they just run Thomas, hold the safety, and let neighbors go to work. Uh, and then there were other times because uh, because Jane Daniels was so talented running the football that, um, uh, you know, people finally said, the heck with it, we're going to bring people up and try to stop this. And you, you play neighbors man to man. He'll run by you, and he did that time. Yeah, after slot time. fades so again and again, Gordy. A lot of slot yeah, fades, yeah. man. Whew. No, there's no, there's no doubt. And so he can do a lot of things. I think. Um, I, I think oh, it's what, what do you want him to do package wise? And, and um, he can go out and play X. He can play wide and, and run all of those routes. I think he works really well in the middle of the football field, kind of the way. There's some comps to, to Jefferson in the terms of the way that he gets off jams. He's elusive beating man coverage, and he's so good after the catch with the with the football. I mean, um, real strong bottom bottom half. You know, Chase was a guy that you know, so good catching afterwards. It was a strong legs. Gordy, did we lose you? I'm here. 
Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. I um, I thought we lost you there for a second. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Just fit, fantastic. And I love Malik Neighbors, by the way. He's my number two wide receiver, a hair below Marvin Harrison Jr. So this is me trying to poke holes is the wrong word, but understanding no. what maybe what some of the potential weaknesses are. The two things that I saw on tape was maybe a little bit too much of a body catcher from time to time. And then maybe some of the nuances of, of route running. So I guess my question would be, A, do you think that's correct? And B, how much room do you think he still has to improve? How raw is he and how much of a finished product do you think Neighbors is? I think he'll continue to get better. I mean, he got a lot of balls with that. I'm, I'm not as, you know, everybody think gets better with route running of course. When, when they get to the league. you, you got to go back two years with this offense. I mean, they were... With a transfer quarterback, first time coordinator, it took Jaden. Uh, Jaden made a lot of progression. I'm sure we, we may talk Jade, about Jaden at some point. Uh, but as he got comfortable and he worked with those two guys in particular this, this past offseason and they were able to get their timing, you know, there were some things that, um, you know, that, that they were really, really successful with. Obviously, the go balls. And you, you saw the Jaden was so much more accurate and um, did a better job with stretching defenses. What I what I love about neighbors is he understands how to get off the line of scrimmage. He understands how to beat man coverage, and then once he catches the ball, it's hard to bring him down. Yep. And, and uh, you know, I mean, that's a that's an art. So I I, I hear you a little bit catching the ball with his body. If we're going to get into to that, but you know, is he a first round talent? And um, he's a blue collar kid. He works hard. You know, and here's the other thing I'll tell you: go go get ten film clips of this kid blocking. Right when other kids are when 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 other kids are catching the ball or when Daniels takes off, uh, you could put a highlight reel together of him blocking downfield. Nah, I like that. That's the good. The 20-yard runs came to 50 to 80. You go back and watch Jane Daniels' highlight film when they get to the NFL draft and watch those receivers blocking downfield. Neighbors was one of the better ones. You actually just took, but I was going to ask my next question: How is he as a uh, run blocker? So instead. Uh, a lot of mock drafts that had the Giants picking a wide receiver in the first round at six overall, somewhat split between Malik Neighbors and Roma Dunze. Uh, Malik, mm-hmm. Na- Malik Neighbors, probably the best at creating separation of any wide receiver in this draft. Roma Dunze, one of his you know best qualities is his ability to catch the contested balls. So how is Malik Neighbors in that co- category, in the contested passes? Yeah, it was fantastic this year. I mean, both of them. I mean, they, they they put up again, you know, historic numbers. And I mean, this is an offense that comes a couple of years after, you know, 2019 with Burrow, Chase Jefferson, uh, Terrence Marshall, and, and and you know all of those guys. Of course, what was different? 19 actually had a defense. This year, this team didn't have a defense, so they were <laughs> they were playing Nintendo numbers at sometimes. Um, but I, I think he's fantastic uh, catching catching contested balls. He's um, I, he plays bigger. He plays more physical, I think, than than probably when when you look at him on the scale. All right, I want to touch on Brian Thomas Jr. real quick because you mentioned, and then I'll let Matt hit Jaden Daniels here as our next topic. Watching Brian Thomas Jr., the size, the speed. I think for a kid that's that big, I think his side to side quickness is actually pretty good too. Uh, but Gordy, I feel like he's still learning and is a little bit raw as as a route runner and and things of that nature. Give me a feel for how Brian Thomas has come along as a wide receiver and where you think his biggest areas of growth still are as he heads into the NFL. Well, I, I think let's this is a this was a basketball power forward that was a star in high school that uh, is unbelievable in fifty fifty balls. You see the the four three what he ran up in Indianapolis. Um, with the basketball, he obviously has, has got tremendous jumps. And, and, you know, I think some of it is can he get better at route running and running, all that stuff? Absolutely. But, you know, at LSU, they ran a lot of 11 personnel. They had him at the X. You wanted him as wide as possible because you wanted to stretch the football field. And, and you, you didn't, I, I don't think they asked that much out of him. You know, right. I, I mean, he, he was able to, to run the comeback, he was able to run the go. He, you know, you, you go time after time. He's such a big kid and physical. He's able to get separation on the quick post play, play um, that they did. But I think because of the nature of what LSU's offense was, that's what they asked him to do. So sure, he could get better at, at route running, but he's a first round talent. I mean, the kid that that big with that sort of ups that can run like that can can get out and and, and play an X for you for quite some time. Uh, now moving over to Jaden Daniels, uh, he obviously has. Good height, you know. I think you keep uh, measured in at six three at the LSU 
pro day. A uh, little lean, though, 210 pounds. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I know throughout his collegiate career, he didn't really miss much time or any time due to injury. But considering his rushing abilities, how much success he has running the ball, and how much he enjoys doing it, do you think durability is at all a concern for him for him at the next level? Like, does he need to get any better at maybe sliding before taking those big hits? <laughs> Let me tell you, if I I went to to after watching him play his first game against Florida State and, and LSU lost in the Superdome two years ago, and I if I had to go make a prop bet, I would have bet you know the odds of him completing an SEC and playing the way that he did, fearless and not sliding and all the above. I would have lost money. I, would, I mean, I was like, get, <laughs> get killed in this conference. And um, and I thought this year with Logan Diggs, and they had better running backs and more experienced offensive line, that he would run less, and I was dead wrong. And, and you know, I think that just the the, the, the offense, the way that it evolved in, um, this past year, it was brilliant, the, the, way, the way they did that. I, like, I saw Steve McNair play at Alcorn State in Baton Rouge against Southern. Um, you know, we saw, I saw a lot of film on Lamar Jackson. Uh, LSU played him at, at Louisville in the bowl game, and and it's seventeen. Look, it's seventeen games in the NFL. You guys know as well as I do. If you're going to tuck the ball, and that's a part of what you do, yeah, durability absolutely is going to be a, a question. Uh, you know, but saying that, Joe Burrow doesn't run the ball at all, and he's been knocked out twice. So I mean, I think it just comes with the position a, a little bit. But uh, yeah, it is a, a question. The flip side of it is. I don't know that I've seen a quarterback make so much progress from that first game against Florida State where there were times he looked lost. He was looking at one receiver and he just took off to having complete control of the whole football game, knowing absolutely what he was seeing. And the fact that they had Thomas and neighbors, um, most teams have to play too high. And I didn't want either of those guys running by. And when they backed off and played, whether it was zone or played two-man, then Jaden was able to recognize it, and he was able to, to, to run for whatever yards he ran. And so uh, high quarterback intel, he, he's much better throwing the football. Accuracy was better. Arm strength was better. Uh, you know, that becomes the question, I think, any time with the NFL's evolved. And, um, you know, how do you feel about going 17 games wherever you're going to play, and your quarterback's going to probably run 10 times during the course of a game? Absolutely. One of the aspects of Daniel's games I want to ask you about, and I think he's a you know top ten worthy pick. He had a great year. Very accurate throw of the football, especially down the field. I wonder what you saw, Gordy, as he adjusted to the offense, and to your point, really learned how to play the quarterback position. How was he in terms of targeting the middle of the field? Because I feel like a lot of his production came on those deep perimeter throws that we talked about on those slot fades to neighbors, a lot of that X stuff going out there to Brian Thomas. But I feel like a really critical factor in being a good NFL quarterback is being able to make those tight window, middle of the field type of throws. Yeah. What, did you, what did you see in that aspect from Jaden over the course of the year? Well, I thought his mechanics got better. And you know, keep in mind, that was the first time I think in his career was with the same offensive coordinator and Mike Denbrock and same offense, had understanding, worked with the same people. Spent some time out in California last summer with, with some of the gurus out there. And um, he looked better in spring, and, and he saw his footwork was better, and just the, the accuracy was really, really sharp. I, I think for him, um, he was running for his life at Arizona State. Um, the fact that he got better protection, he had understanding of what he was going to do, and uh, the, the, the anxiety level went down, and he just sat and, and stayed with it and was able to stay with the progressions and just had a better pre-snap idea of what's going on. It's Look, I'm going to look at one here. If this isn't open, I'm going to two. If two is covered, that probably means I can run, and he took off running the football. And so rarely was he you know, making poor decisions. And so that, that was what I, again, I think the the growth that he had in his two years at LSU was phenomenal. Uh, So one more question about Jaden Daniels. Got to ask. There was a photo from the Pro Day a couple weeks ago that went viral with his throw and elbow. So just got to ask, like, is everything all right there? (laughs) Yeah, as far as I know. I mean, it's funny you saw that. I mean, hell, I was on the sideline for two years and didn't see that. I saw the first time. I'm like, is that a Photoshop? But no, as far as I know, it's all right. Yeah, it's amazing, and and you watch that with Major League Baseball pitchers too when they're like, as they're releasing the ball, 
Elbow does some weird stuff. It's the reason those guys <laughs> tear their UCLs all the time and have Tommy John surgery constantly. Uh, but, yeah, yeah I, I, I would not have any issues with that. Uh, just anything, Gordy, before we move on to, to um, the defensive side of the ball real quick, anything about Jane that we miss that you think either people are underplaying about him or overrating about him considering you've been around him and been around him so closely for two years? No, you know, and all the draft stuff's going to come out. Look, I, I think he, you know, California kid, kind of laid back, but um, such a positive demeanor, such a leader, not 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 a vocal screaming, but uh, a, a leader. And I will tell you, the, 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 the kid, it, it looked effortless at times. And every time I'm sitting from here to the sideline watching him, the kid's running with a smile on his face. <laughs> I mean, he's just having a ball. I mean, here's the, he, and when you watch him run, if I say, well, this is a four six forty kid, not a four three, whatever he runs. Hey, look, he's so much faster than he looks. It's kind of deceiving because of the, you know, the body composition. But um, I, I think you're getting uh, you're getting a quality individual, and I will say that with uh, know, the, know the mom, uh, been around the kid enough, feel real real comfortable with that kid being in my locker room and being under center for my team. I will let Matt hit the defensive guys here real quick. I want to yep. ask about Charles Turner because I loved him at the Senior Bowl. Yep. I think he's really competitive. I think he's feisty. Uh, maybe slightly undersized, but for center, I, I think it's fine. What can you tell me about Charles Turner, and do you think he has a chance to be an eventual starter in the NFL? Yeah, I think that, you know, he he, he came from, a, you know, IMG, and he was undersized coming in. I think he was 240 when LSU signed him. Wow. He had a frame and gradually put on weight and gra- improved each and every year. A very good athlete down there. Um, and, and keep in mind, two years ago, uh, they had two true freshmen that started. They took a kid from Florida International that started, I think, two transfers and at center, and it was a makeshift line. They threw them together, and they took their lumps with Daniels, and they got better right, as the season went along. And so, you know, I think that, uh, you know, that, that still becomes the, the how much bigger and more explosive in strength does he need to put on to be successful in the NFL. But he has the frame to do it, and his performance was solid this year on field. Uh, just real quick, you you touched on how Jaden Daniels, how great of a person he is. Just want a quick note. For anyone that wants to know a little bit more about Jane Daniels, he had an article in the Players Tribune that came out last night, pretty much showing just how great of a person he is oh, off the field. Oh, didn't read that yet. So, I just check that out. want to say, I highly recommend giving that a read. It'll give you a, some insight into the off the field stuff of Jane Daniels. Uh, so, moving on to the defense, uh, there are three guys in particular that seem to be the uh, LSU guys that are going to be drafted on the defensive side of the ball. All defense alignment. Uh, we have yeah. Mason Smith, Makai Wingo, Jordan Jefferson. Uh, so we'll start with Mason Smith. Uh, how concerning do you think his injury history is? I know the last, I believe it's the last two seasons he's had, and or 2022 and 2021, or 2022 and last year he had season-ending injuries. 2021 he was a freshman All-American. So just how concerning are the, is his injury history, do you think? Well, I mean, you got it's a concern, and he hadn't played a whole lot of football. And, and this, this was arguably the best defensive line prospect in the state coming to senior year. He's down from the, the Bayou South of New Orleans and familiar with, obviously, his career. I mean, we walks on the field, he looks six, six foot seven. I, I mean, he's, a, he's an absolute powerhouse. And, you know, and, and he couldn't stay healthy. Um, and, and in terms of, uh, I think, technique, um, was really behind because of those injuries. And the one of the deals with LSU this year, they made a change of defensive line coach and uh, they, they shuffled, uh, they hired a new def- the defensive line coach, went to the Broncos. They brought in a uh, another guy that had an off the field situation, was not able to coach. And so they wound up having a linebacker coach in there. And they uh, eventually had to bring in a guy named Pete Jenkins, who is a uh, defensive line guru. I think is close to 80. He coached when I was there, but they brought him in because they didn't have a, you know somebody to teach technique. And and so they, the defensive line got much better as the season went along. They had their, their knocks down there. I, I think Smith's got to get his pad level down. Um, he's a tremendous uh, physical specimen. Uh, I would draft him and put him on the practice squad for a year or two get him more explosive in the weight room. I got to get his pad level down. I got to work with technique. Um, if you can do that, you're sitting with a six, seven, whatever, 320 pound beast that, that 
obviously fits everything that you're looking for in the NFL. I, I think that's what he, he needs. I, a lot of people, and I think it would have been wiser for him to come back to school and, and, and get to play a little bit more and, and, and play some more ball and, and work on his technique. And so I think that's kind of, to me, he needs a red shirt here in the NFL to work on those things. Yeah, and, and honestly, I think to your point, Mason Smith, you see him at the combine, and you're like, he's got shoulders up to his ears. The guy just looks yeah. like he was built to play football. And maybe less physically imposing is Makai Wingo, his teammate, but I liked his tape better than Smith this year, Gordy. I think he can oh, be yeah. a one-gap penetrator. He gets into the backfield. He's an athletic guy. I think he's a guy that can be a pass rusher from defensive tackle on day one. Yeah, no, no. Wingo was All-American last year, and he, he had some injuries this year and, and never really got back to, to 100%. Yep. And... um uh, I think he has a tremendous uh, upside in the right scheme. Is he a guy that's going to two gap and keep people off? He doesn't have that sort of size, but he's quick, incredible kid. Plays with a great motor. Was a transfer from Missouri that came down here, and uh, uh, you know, uh, you're getting a, a high quality person as well. And I'm with you. Wingo to me uh, is a, is an overachiever, and I, I like that spot if you're going to get in there and let him to shoot gaps and in the right defense. Yeah, so Smith sort of has, you know, the the great size but had limited production, somewhat limited production at LSU. Wingo's the opposite. He had all the production, not right. as, not really the size though. So sticking with Wingo, do you think he profiles more as a rotational pass rusher in the NFL or do yeah. you think he can develop into at least somewhat more of a three-down player? Good question. He's fine on a run. I, I don't think it, there's you know, I don't think he's a three down players part of the package, right? Um, I, you know, I, I just to me the league's just become that. I don't, I don't think uh, that he's in, in that profile. You know, first round guy's going to going to play three, four series for you, but I, he plays a run well. He's, he, you know, he of all the defensive linemen, he's really technique sound, fundamentally sound, uh, understands the position, and uh, you know, just had a uh, because of the injuries, had a, a disappointing last year at LSU. All right, final question, Gordy. We'll let you go. Uh, Jordan Jefferson, I, I think maybe a little undersized to be a nose tackle, but I think yep. he plays that way, right? I, I think he's a yep. guy you can ask to two-gap and stop the run. Give yeah. me a your quick take on him, and then if there's any other players that we miss that you think we should be thinking about for the draft, you let us know. No, that's it. I, he's, I think Jefferson's the last one. Uh, look, um, only had him for a year. Came from West Jeff, uh, West, Jeff, from, um, West Virginia. And um, I, I think he hit it on the head, was really, really disruptive, is a guy that will eat up space, played with a great motor, a motor was surprisingly disruptive at times in, in the, the pass rush game and was probably their best defensive lineman this year. And so, you know, is a guy going to play three downs for you? No, but can be part of a rotational package. And, and, and do some stuff for you and where you can be multiple up front. Yeah, I do think he fits that. Gordy, great information, my friend. Thank you much for being with us. You've been loyal to us for many years, giving us a lowdown on these LSU guys, and maybe one of them will wind up with the Giants this year. We'll see. Appreciate it, my friend. Thank you. Okay, guys. Thank you. Gordy Rush, you can catch him on the sidelines covering uh, the LSU Tigers down there in the SEC. And another great LSU class, Mr. Sytac, and I would not oh, yeah. be surprised if one of those defensive tackles – or one of these offensive players we mentioned as well winds up on Big Blue come the draft and anywhere from rounds one through four or five. A hundred percent. I mean, <laughs> we've seen Malik Neighbors connected to the Giants in, I would say, majority of mock drafts. I would say him and Odunze, right, are probably the two most common picks. A hundred percent, those two. I mean, so Neighbors clearly is in the conversation for six. I'd say Jaden Daniels would be in the conversation at six, too, but I don't think there's any chance he makes it down to six. You know, maybe if he starts slipping, if he gets past Washington. I think that's a trade-up situation. That would probably have to be a trade-up yep, situation. I'm but, with you. look, you never know. Crazy things happen on draft night. Yes, they do. But And Brian Thomas Jr., you know, if there's the situation in which the Giants trade down from six and, you know, let's just say, for example, with the Vikings and get 11 and 23, something like that, Brian Thomas Jr. could definitely be in consideration for uh, the 11th pick. I mean, he's probably – Widely considered the the fourth best receiver. I Not mean, sure it will be for me at the end, but yes, most people have most as people, the consensus for most that's people. correct. And yeah, that I is mean, a consensus. You're right. And you mentioned these defensive tackles. I mean, I personally still think that's a position that the Giants need to address at some point, whether it's you know later in the draft, day two, day three, or 
in free agency. Who knows? But if they decide to wait until potentially like day three, early parts of day three, I could see them, as you said, taking one of these defensive tackles from LSU. Three guys, all very talented, a little bit different in each of their game, but all three, I think, could fit next to Dexter Lawrence. In yeah, the I interior think line. I would say Jefferson, more of a day three guy for me, and yeah. I think Wingo and Smith might get into round three. Though, honestly, Mason Smith is so gifted physically, even though his tape, to Gordy's point, he thought he should have came back this year. I think so, too. You mentioned he a season-ending surgery at the end of the 2021 season, missed all of 2022. Then he came back this year and still didn't quite, to me, look as good as he did pre-surgery. Yep. A team might just say, look, look look at the traits on this dude. Like, he's, a, he's massive, he can move, and they might end up using a, a round, late round two pick on him. It wouldn't shock me. Yeah, I mean, Daniel Jeremiah is one of the top draft analysts, you know, in the business. Was he in his top and 50? In yesterday, he just came out with his new top 50 yesterday. He was already number 50, and he moved up to, I think, 49 or 48. There you go. So if you want to go by what Jeremiah thinks, thinks he could be a round two pick even. And well, we- all of it would be based on, as you said, his physical traits and not the film because well, he's just, it hasn't, uh, other than the freshman year, which again, was freshman All American, showed a lot of promise. His last season, he got better as the season went on because he had the season ending injury. Apparently, he played like one series in 2022. Yeah, well, it was a So, anything. missed pretty mm-hmm. much the whole season. And then this past year, it took him time to sort of get, get going again. I think the second half of the season showed more than the first half. Um, and Gordy said he was a top recruit in the country yeah. that year. Looks it. I mean, you look at him, that doesn't <laughs> surprise me based no. on what the kid looks like. All right, we're going to have Mickey Plyler, who covers Clemson in just a second here. Pearson's getting him up. In the meantime, gives me a chance to promote the Giants Huddle podcast, folks. You're listening to Big Blue Kickoff Live. Thank you for subscribing and doing all that stuff. Well, you should also go check out the Giants Huddle podcast. I'm going to pat myself on the back here a little bit. I don't care. We've had some great episodes this week and a lot more great episodes coming up. Uh, talking to people around the league about what the Giants have done in free agency, about the draft. Uh, Ryan Wilson from CBS is up there. Uh, Steven Ruiz and I had a really good conversation about how you evaluate quarterbacks coming out of college. Matt, if you haven't listened to it, you should. Just a good conversation of how you go about it, the best way to try to project them. Uh, that was a fantastic conversation. Uh, we're going to have uh, Nate Tice coming up. We're going to have Matt Miller coming up uh, from ESPN. Uh, think I'm going to get Kurt Warner at some point early next week. We'll, we'll keep an eye on that. And then some of our usual suspects will be uh, rolling through as well over the next two weeks. I think we're going to try to do five a week until we get up to the draft year, one a day. Pearson's psyched about it, let me tell you. <laughs> He's fired up about all the editing. Uh, but it'll be some really good content. So go subscribe to the Giants Huddle Podcast on your favorite podcast platform, giants.com slash podcast, or just go to the Giants mobile app. And if you're on Apple Podcasts for any of our Giants offerings, leave that five-star positive review. It really helps us out. More people can find the podcast. We can do more of them. So Pearson has more work, and you'll get more good Giants content. Mm-hmm. All right, let's go to Mickey Plyler. He has a morning show on 105.5 FM, The Roar, down there in South Carolina. He does a great job com- covering the Clemson Tigers. Mickey, you got John Schmelk and Matt Sytak up here in East Rutherford, New Jersey. Hope you're well, my friend. I am great, man. Look, we got uh, we got Northeast weather today, but we'll get back down to 80 this weekend. We got a spring game here this weekend. You guys got open today with the Yankees up there. So, uh, yeah, man, we're excited. It should be a- and I'll hear you talk about the draft. It's fascinating. The draft is fascinating to me. With that being said, it's interesting how you know how it all works out and what people evaluate. And I know you guys are on. I got a high pick. Got to be an exciting year for the Giants. It is, and they have a, a picks up and down the draft where I think some of these Clemson players might come into consideration here, Mickey. So I want to start with Nate Wiggins. I like him more than most. If there's one cornerback in this draft where if I'm in a life or death situation and I have to have one guy cover a wide receiver one-on-one and if he stops him, I get to live, I think I would take Nate Wiggins out of this draft class. I think his raw coverage skills are that good with his length, change of direction, and his speed. And that's not based on his combine testing. That's based on me watching him during the year. I've been saying this for a couple months. But the problem is that he was listed at 173. That's what he weighed in at the combine. He was 10 pounds heavier at, at the Clemson Pro Day. Didn't run at the Clemson Pro Day. I wouldn't either when I went sub 4-3 at the, at the combine. I don't blame him. So tell me about Wiggins, his coverage ability. But more importantly, did you see his frame and his lack of weight and strength show up when you watched him over his career with Clemson? 
Great questions. Um, watched him a lot. I, wa- I watched him in high school and watched him come here, and he developed. You know, Clemson's got a, a, a pretty good cornerback lineage uh, through the years, and uh, we've seen some great ones. We've seen some guys go to the league and, and play great. We've seen some guys go to the league and bust. I, I, I just compare him to who we've had here, uh, compare him to other guys in this draft. And uh, You're right about the speed. I mean, the top-end speed is legit. Uh, if you saw the North Carolina game, you saw him run down a guy from – behind to kind of save the football game. Yep. Uh, he, he's got that kind of top end speed. The change of direction is very good. For a guy his height, too, you know, I used to joke that God didn't make six foot, two or three inch guys that can change direction, but he's making a lot more of those nowadays, it seems like, 20 <laughs> years ago than he used to. With that said, yeah, I mean, you know, and, and again, I watch a little bit of the league. I don't watch it like you guys do, but, but I mean, maybe there are guys in the league that, that aren't physical, that don't tackle well. I mean, Dion certainly was not a not a guy who want to stick his nose in there. Wiggins is not going to be the guy. Uh, there's Obviously, there's places in the league for the guy. There's many, many screen games and quick throw games to break up those and, the, and the, to tackle bigger guys and to play on the perimeter and tackle bigger backs and all that. There's a place for that. If that's what you're looking for, that's not Wiggins. If you're looking for a cover guy that, that can shut down, um, like I said, great length, like you said, great change of directions, that's your guy. But he's not I mean, he's not going to be mistaken for some physical guy that's going to beat up a wide receiver on the edge or, or bust up those screen game on the edge. It's just not who he is. Yeah, so looking at his size, his athleticism, and his production while at Clemson, honestly it feels like Nate Wiggins should be you know, ranked a lot higher, at least in the media, than he currently is. Uh, do you think his production, I guess, in run defense is one of the biggest reasons why, I guess, at least in the media's eyes, he's not ranked as high? Or is there another area that you think he needs to improve on at the next level? Well, personally now, and I, you know, I've done this with you guys for a few years now, and I, I harp on this. And I'm not a guy telling a billionaire how to invest his dollars. I mean, I'm, I'm, no, nobody listens to a guy broke uh, listening to how to invest his money. But if I'm an NFL owner, I'm going to invest – in the Dexter Lawrence's of the world, you know, like you guys have. I'm going to invest in these guys that I can count on and dependability. He had one run in with the staff that caused him not to start a game. Uh, they lost the game in the middle of the season. He's a competitor like a lot of guys. and ran his mouth a little bit to the staff. So, you know, that, that, that might hurt him a little bit. But in the end, there's a lot. he's not a bad kid, but there's a lot worse kids that will be drafted higher and have been drafted in the NFL draft. I'm just saying, you know, to me, that's always a little bit of a factor. He's not a low-character guy, but he did have a little bit of an issue there. In, in the run game, he, he, he's a great tackler in the open field, but he, he's a low tackler now. I mean, he, he's going he's an ankle biter. Um, he's not going to take on blocks. He's not going to bust up, like I said, bust up a screen game or anything, a quick throw game. But but you know, most of the times against college wide receivers, you know, he, he gets his guy to the ground. That being said, you know, bigger, stronger, making the adjustments. I mean, like almost every player, he's going to have an adjustment. He's not as big as that Toledo kid. He's not as physical as that kid. But you know, speed wise, yeah. I mean, it's, it's cover. But if there's issues, it is in the run game or. Uh, open, like I said, he's a good open field tackler. He doesn't miss, but he's not gonna. You know, he's gonna get his guy on the ground. He's not gonna, you know, physically beat up anybody. And I would, that would concern me matchup wise in the league a little bit. Your yeah, final question on him, Mickey, uh, for me at least. He didn't really seem to miss any time with injuries, though, right? I know he's had some injuries in 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 the pre draft postseason process here. Yeah. Um, but in his career at Clemson, it seems like he even despite that frame, he was able to stay fairly healthy. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing about it. I mean, how, how big do you play from an injury standpoint? And, you know, you get freakish injuries. He didn't miss time here. He didn't miss practice here. He didn't miss time here. Um, that was not an issue at all. So, you know, you say that, and he'll, you know, he has missed time throughout this deal. Uh, he had a little bit of a hamstring maybe. But, no, nah, he's not missed any football time around this way. He's a good – he comes from a good program. He came up the right way. He's very well coached in college. And, um, like, the other thing is even in, in when he makes mistakes – that that makeup speed, you know, oh, you're going to turn the wrong way, flip your hips the wrong way, whatever. He's got that makeup speed. He can close down pretty quickly. Uh, moving uh, up to the defensive line, uh, I'm probably going to mispronounce oh, go for this. It. Go for it. That's okay. R- Ruke Aroro. That's pretty good. Rook. Yeah. Well, you Rook? Add, even add one more in there. Rook Aroro. Rook Aroro. <laughs> Yeah, Aurora. you have a lot of Scooby Doo yeah. going on at the end of the last day. <laughs> yes, that, all right. Exactly. Now that, we, now, now that we got that down, uh, so a big strength of his uh, was his ability to sort of line up all over the defensive line the last few seasons. He his size six foot four, two hundred ninety four pounds. Do you think that he can develop into like a full three down player at the NFL? And what does he need to do if he's not already that? Like, what does he need to do to get to that level? 
first interesting kid, like a lot of these guys now, very athletic, these, these pass rushing defensive linemen, um, a, a guy who played basketball in high school, you know, got those basketball skills. Uh, good frame on him. He got better and better. He was not a highly recruited kid here. You know, he's about a three-star kid, but he beat out some some better players and some higher-rated players. Interesting personality, bright kid. You know, he's got a um, you know a little a little uh, sense about him when he walks in the room. He's got a little presence about him. He is um, he's like very athletic, a, a good interior pass rusher. And you know, play mostly four-three here. Uh, in the three odd man front, he could play a little bit of defensive end for him, you know, not like a five technique sometimes, but uh, not not the he's got great great you know runs well quickness well. I'm not sure he stands up in the NFL game there. It'd be interesting to where, you know where he plays in the NFL, but athleticism wise, um, it's a high up upside, you know. But maybe a little lower ceiling. I mean, lower floor, but the ceiling's pretty high because I still think his best his football is the best ahead of him. His best football is ahead of him. He's a I hate to say raw because he's been around here a long time, but he just keeps getting better and keeps getting better, more acclimated to the game. And so he's a guy I wouldn't be surprised if he stays in the league, you know, through a second contract. And, and but also because of some, uh, you know, lack of experience, you know, he didn't play here until about the middle part of his career. You know, wouldn't be surprised if he, if he didn't make that second contract. So uh, high high risk, high reward is how I would put that. Uh, if you if you need him in the second round, maybe you know, can see him going down the third round, and, and he might be like a steal, but. It's not a no-brainer. He does have a few little issues there. All right, uh, let's stick on the defensive line because this is the guy that I think freed Rook up to do all that pass rushing he did. That was Tyler Davis. Not the biggest guy at just 6'2", 301, but, boy, watching his tape and watching him down at the Senior Bowl during team drills, he plays like a big guy. He takes on blockers. He stops the run. He can move guys. Tell me a little bit about Tyler Davis. To me, if you need a guy that can be on the inside of your defense and stop the run, and he'll probably be there on day three, I think he's a really, really safe pick given what he's done at Clemson. Boy, you've been watching film, man. You got this down, right? So I, I think that's you hit the nail on the head. It's a very, very safe pick. Again, not the upside of Rook, but a safe pick because he reminds us. We had, we had a Grady Jarrett here a few years ago. Grady's going to do great things with the, with the Falcons. Uh, I think he's their, he's their franchise player, the highest paid defensive lineman they've had in their history. Uh, but but because the, the deal is a motor. I mean, like you said, not very – uh, tall, not very big, but but and a little bit like a soft body. Like it doesn't look all that impressive, but he makes plays and he plays sideline to sideline. You see, you know, so rare to see an interior guy go out and, and run down a screen play, uh, run down a quick throw play. Um, a, a pretty good pass rusher, not a good pass rusher is Rook. Probably more stable against a run, more stable at eating blocks. Just a, a little wider body. Rook's more of a slender, taller, leaner looking thing, and. And Tyler's a you know more of a, a two gap I mean a, a you know a, you know two gap technique guy. He's a guy that's gonna um, he's gonna make some team really happy. He's gonna play in the league a long time. Not sure he'll ever be a Pro Bowler by any stretch, but a guy is just gonna be very consistent. And part of that's just the work ethic. He's, he's natural with his hands and does some things. But what he's not natural at, he's just a really hard worker and a very safe pick. Sticking with the defense, uh, I want to talk about Jeremiah Trotter Jr. Uh, obviously yeah. comes from some pretty strong bloodlines with his father playing almost 11 years or 11 year career, almost all of which was in the NFC East against the Giants. Uh, so Jeremiah Trotter Jr. had a ton of production at Clemson despite his lack of size and length. How do you think yeah. he makes up for his physical shortcomings? And is it all his high football IQ or what exactly is it? Well, you've you hit that nail on the head, too, because it is high football IQ. Grew up, I mean, his dad was awesome with him. Uh, one of my questions would be, like, could the Giants draft a longtime Eagles guy? Right? <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, well, of course you got, you know, you're right. That'll be some payback now, so for Saquon, Mickey. That's payback that's for right. Saquon right Hey, we, we, just, exactly we, just, right. we just signed John that's Runyon Jr. That's true. We did sign John Runyon Jr. Great point, Matt. <laughs> there you go. Now, he, I'll tell you what about Jeremiah. The thing I like about him more than anything is his versatility because – you, when, you, when you watch the film, like, between the tackles, he makes plays. Uh, in the run game, he does make plays. Uh, I think he's better at the other two aspects. Of it. He rushes the passer really well. He's got that natural instinct to, to you know, get lower, uh, to, to bend, to, to get around offensive linemen, and just that natural pass rush, or, or to read where the quarterback might be seeing and thinking and, and escaping, you know, like on a secondary kind of deal, a spy kind of deal. He does a great job just instincts-wise. He finds the football in the run game. He rushes the quarterback well, but but maybe as well as anybody we had here in a long time at Clemson, 
he's awesome at dropping into coverage. He's got a couple of pick sixes in his career. He changed a couple of football games here, pick six wise, some interceptions, batted balls down. I like him dropping, you know, and and uh, and, and instincts there of you know, so many times in the play action game, it seemed like he just made the right decision and was never out of place through that. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure how much you're playing man with, with that now, but but dropping into those zones, the hooks and curl zones, man, he's awesome at that and reads the quarterback's eyes really, really well. He's a bright kid. He had a little hamstring at the beginning of this year that kind of slowed his, his junior year. Before that, he was really coming on. And I think work ethic. Uh, I fought him in high school, and, and, and we had a local high school here that had a camp. And he's one of these uh, yes sir, no sir types. But he asked the guy, could I you know, get on the field earlier? They're locking the, field, the gate up, and can I get out there and stay out there longer? Really just outwork people. And the coach from his dad. You can tell those kids have been around NFL and, and that work ethic. But, man, you talk about picks. He's my favorite. You know, Wiggins is the more talented one. Rook's got a, a much higher ceiling. Davis is probably consistent, but man, you can find a lot of that in there. I, I like Trotter. I think Trotter is one of those guys. I know it's not a high priority position. Man, Jeremiah Trotter Jr. is going to play a long time in this league, in my opinion. Yeah, Mickey, you, you you stole the words out of my mouth. I thought he was really good in zone. I'm not sure he's got the speed to cover man to man, but uh, yeah. I agree. I I think he's a he would be a solid pick, kind of end the round two, start a round three type of deal, yeah. where where a team can use a uh, you know linebacker that can run and chase a little bit. All right. Um, I'll ask you about Xavier Thomas. I watched him up close in Frisco at the Shrine Bowl, and I walked out of there saying, how did this guy not have more sacks for Clemson? Because he, you, you basically built an edge rusher in a lab, and he kind of looks like Xavier Thomas. He's 6'2", 244. Uh, I, I feel like he has all the, the talent and skills you want, and he stayed at Clemson a long time, but he never really blew up. I don't think his production matched those physical traits. So what in your mind was kind of holding Xavier Thomas back from emerging as one of those first-round edge rushers? You know what's crazy about Xavier Thomas? He came out in the same high school class as, as Trevor Lawrence. And, like, Lawrence has been in the league for three years. Are you serious? You know, wow. Six. They, they were the number one, number two players in the country, number two and three in the country. Um, obviously, you know, Dexter – I mean, uh, uh, Trevor worked out here. Uh, Xavier Thomas is a very interesting study. Came out of high school, a freakish athlete in 270 in that range. Um, and has gone through every kind of, of adversity you can have. So, as a freshman – he makes a huge impact as, as a role player. You know, he's, he's got good defense down here at that time, national championship kind of runs. And, but he was a third-down specialist. That's all he did. He just rushed the passer. Didn't know how to set the edge, nothing against the run. Uh, not, assignment-wise, wasn't great, but a great pass rusher. And he's a 270-pound kind of guy. He goes sophomore year, junior year. These get mixed up now. It's been so around so long. Some injuries in there, balloons up to 280-something. Uh, doesn't have a great productive, you know, years two and three here. Has years like four. Um, he's thinking about coming out at that point in time, but wasn't very productive, wasn't very mature, was in the doghouse a little bit, then turns his life around, um, gets with the right people, dedicates himself, has a major injury. I'm not sure what it was at this point in time, like the, the fifth year. 2022. And, that uh, was the, yeah, I think that was 2022. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Set out the entire year, and then comes back for a, gets a sixth season here. What you know the COVID year and all that, and and gets down to two like you said two hundred fifty pounds, two hundred forty five pounds, and was a more of a speed rusher. So, there, to me, at one point in time, there's like, is, is he is he a, a four three defensive end? And I didn't think he was you know good enough against a run and setting the edge to ever do that. And I thought he was too big to play outside. Well, he drops all that weight now. You know, an outside linebacker, pass rusher. He can certainly do that. He's not been asked to cover. He's always had a hand on the ground here. He's not been asked to cover anybody. I'm not sure how you know if he can do that or not. But that edge rusher, it's a good body now, man. He's always had a great body, but his, his body's changed so much. He, but but I think more than anything else, he became a man here. He was an immature kid uh, for a long time. You know, the first half of his career, maybe. But but you know, he's 20. I don't. That's another thing's the age part of it. But he just matured. He's a man now, and he's a reliable kind of you know person now. He's gonna be successful. I'm not sure in the league. You know, it, it's got to be a special situation for him. But yeah, when 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 God made the pass rushers, now you look at him, it looks like a, a, a really good edge kind of guy now. Moving over to the offense, there's I, I believe just one player that uh, is likely at least to get drafted this year, right. uh, Will Shipley. So. While at Clemson, he kind of did a little bit of everything. He had production as a runner, as a receiver, even some production as a, a kick returner. 
where do you think he can find his, the best role for himself in the NFL? You know what's interesting? Like the new kickoff rules. Um, what what like? And you guys might. I'll ask you a question first. Yeah. What what kind of body is going to be a kickoff return guy with a new kickoff? Rule? Yeah, it's a great question. I, we we actually been asking that question, Mickey, and I think it's going to be different from team to team. I think NFL teams are still figuring it out. Yeah. If it is a running back guy, I mean, he's not he's not a four you know sub four four guy. He's got good speed, good top end speed. The acceleration's not not you know off the charts or anything. But it's a physical, sturdy kind of guy. The only other thing I would say, you know, top end speed. Now, let me tell you a quick story if you guys have time. Yeah, please. Uh, great friend of mine was, was a longtime coach. He played here, Whitey Jordan. He coached at, at SMU. Now, get this. He coached Eric Dickerson and Craig James at SMU. And then went to the University of Florida, and he coached uh, Emmett Smith at the University of Florida. So they're, 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 he knows running back. They're right? okay. They're fine. They're, yeah. they're, they're okay. Yeah. When Emmett came out, the NFL scouts told him that you know several of the guys we don't you know Emmett wasn't a, well, highly thought of in that first round in that in the area you know back in that first round, but he said the scouts would tell him we don't we're not sure Emmett can take it 80, 80 yards, and he said sure he can twenty 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 and twenty, and he went on to become the, <laughs> the all time leading rusher in the league, right? So and, and I'm not sure how many times guys you know guys will take eighty yards in the league anymore. Nobody misses enough tackles there. So I'm interested in in, in Shipley. He's a he's a four zero kid here. He never made a B here. He's a tremendously hard worker. They try to compare him to Christian McCaffrey in some ways, and I get some of that. He catches the football well out of the backfield. Uh, sticks his nose up in their blocks a little bit. You know, uh, breaks tackles. Tough, you know, a good short yardage guy. He's strong between the tackles. Good lower body, good lean. He's got all that stuff in there. Uh, had some fumble issues here, and that was a that was a major issue for him. Um, and not a guy – he's not going to make a whole lot of NFL guys miss. Didn't make a whole lot of college guys miss. But he did break some tackles. And I'm not sure what the league thinks about running backs at times. I'm not sure, you know, the, the NFL draft what they think about uh, at times. But like, like like McCaffrey, like some of these guys, you get in the right system. Uh, I think you can play the league, you know, a while. I'm not sure he can be an every down back or a feature back in the league. But, I, but worth a draft pick in that, you know, fourth round kind of thing. Wouldn't surprise me at all if he stayed in the league a while. Mickey, but a very interesting prospect. I got to be honest with you. I loved Will Shipley, and not enough people are talking about him, in my opinion, because he's been hurt in the post draft process. He hasn't done anything at the right. combine. I don't think he did anything at Clemson Pro Day, if I'm not mistaken. I have to go back and check those numbers right. if he did or not. But I feel like he's been lost in the shuffle here because I went back and I watched him, and he can do everything. He's shifty in yeah. the hole. He's got a low center of gravity. He can break tackles. To your point, he's going to stick his nose in there. And he, to me, he's somewhere in that fourth to sixth best running back in this class. And I don't think enough people are talking about him. I think he can step into the league day one, be a 15-touch-a-game type of guy. I do wonder yeah. about I think he's like 206. So I wonder about his ability to kind of take that pounding in terms of being an every down back. Uh, but... I just wanted to give my take on it. I think Will Shipley is a really good running back, and I think he's a guy that will go in round three in this draft, and I think a team's going to get a pretty darn good player. Uh, you can comment on that, and then if there's any other guys that we missed that you think we should touch on, please let us know. Well, a couple of things. Uh, yeah, all right. and pretty good vision, too. Yeah. You know, uh, Clemson does not have – they're not known for an offensive line yet. I think that's coming here pretty soon. i got a, I got a question about offensive line guys in a second. But, so, you know, that, that's one thing. Uh, but, but, you know, short yardage, like really good there – you know, making the guy miss in the hole and, and some shiftiness in the hole like that. And, it, you know, got a bunch of – he turned, I tell you, you know, back to me the value in the college game at least is can he turn nothing into two or two into four or four into eight kind of a thing. He turned a lot of four-yard runs into eight-yard yeah, runs. Yeah, I'm with you. And, yeah, and, and, and you know, the guy who, who – to me there's a value in that. Um, and so, yeah, in the right system. And like I said, a good kid, you want to invest in that. I might, I might, you know, I know there's some bad guys in the league, and I know there's a lot of bad guys that came out of college that went in the league and, and, and you know, transformed themselves that way. But you're not going to worry about work ethic, showing up, being, you know, healthy. Now, again, he's a lot like, like Wiggins a little bit or but that hadn't had any health issues here at all. He did have a health issue at the, on the very last play of a kickoff return. He's a good kickoff return guy, but he's not great top-end speed, but – you know, some burst and some vision, uh, some short area quickness got him through some of that. And, I, again, I think it would be interesting to see, can he get it in the wide receiver game, in the, in the throw game a little bit, in the, in the short yardage game a little bit, you know, get him in space a little bit, McCaffrey-type stuff, not not the NFL MVP, but, you know, a guy that can, can play a role for you, I feel like. Hey, uh, speaking of running backs, Clemson has a commitment from a high school junior, um, 
uh, Brayden Jacobs, Brandon Jacobs' son. <laughs> and we, we joked on our show. He said he's living in Atlanta. We joked on our show that the kid's 6'7 and, and like 3'10. And I still said uh, smaller than the running back for the Giants, his dad, all those years. <laughs> Man, what a – had some great memories there. He, he, I'm sure he's got to be well thought of. Like he's one of these, what top five or so backs in Giant history, maybe. Uh, I would say uh, Jacobs top ten for sure. Yeah, I think he's yeah. all, all time leading rushing, rushing touchdowns, touchdowns. Yep. in Giants history. Yeah. Yes, but uh, by that. the way, not a surprise, Mickey, that his son is gigantic because his father also gigantic. Oh, oh <laughs> big guy. Hey, the other thing is, what uh, is Isaiah Simmons? Are, are they, they are they going to sign him? I know he, they had him last year. Is he is they have plans? Does he have a future of the Giants? Yeah, good question. Still a free agent. Um, Shane Bowen is the new defensive coordinator. He was kind of a wink guy, so I don't know what yeah. this new defensive staff thinks of him. So right now he's still out there. That might be a deal where you see what you get in the draft. And then you decide yeah. whether or not you want to add him back, depending on what your depth chart looks like. Hey, you got like that's what the draft is to me. Like Isaiah Simmons, if I'm a a, a, a GM, Isaiah Simmons is the guy that's going to drive you crazy <laughs> because there's so <laughs> much to like, and then there's so many questions that you have. And man, I'm going to invest that very valuable pick and a lot of money in a guy that has all kinds of questions. But the upside is so high, man. And, and, and how many guys have you, have you seen that? You had that, and it turned out to be great. Mickey, you remember and, this. And, we talked about Isaiah Simmons. We yep. were talking about him as the yep. Giants' potential pick at six that yep. year. It was the year they yep. drafted Andrew Thomas. And we were trying yep. to go, right, well, is he a safety? Is he a linebacker? What can he do? Yeah. And the answer is that no one's still figured out where you're going to yeah. stick him on a play-in, play-out basis, which has kind of been the problem. Yeah, it, it's um, a, a, a jack of all trades, but a master of none, and he just doesn't have a specialty, you know, in there. If you remember on this segment, I can remember it well that I told you about Dexter Lawrence, man. Like, if you guys get a chance, he's just that guy. He's got that. He's got that personality. He's got that work. He's got that body. That that freakish athletic ability. And I think I'm right because I don't watch you guys every week. But I think you're right, and, and he's still still in good good uh, standing there with everybody still liking there. Oh, great dude. We love Dex. They just signed him to the monster extension that I think kicks in this year, actually. Right. So, yep. yeah, he's yeah. going to be here for the long time. He he might be the best player on the team, to be quite honest with you. Yeah. It, 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 it's either him or Andrew Thomas, right? But Dex has been healthy more often, so I think you got to give the, the, the nod to Dex. Back-to-back all pro. Yep. So you got, yeah, can't go wrong. You, you guys are you guys are doing uh, wide receiver, maybe. Yeah. What, what what's the uh, the need? Wide receivers. I would say wide receiver is in the mix there. You know, quarterback, depending on you know what they think of the class, uh, that's an option. You can you know you, you can never go wrong with offensive line. I suppose I would say those would be the three major you know positions that I think if at they six, stick at six yeah. that they would be interested in. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting spot, man, you know, and a valued spot. You know, trading up or trading down, and some—I don't know what you know, the rest of your picks. I think you got like one per round, like you yep. haven't stockpiled anything. But you got about the teams. And again, I don't follow it closely yet. I'm going to get into the next week or two. But you guys are in a great and at least a, an intriguing spot. Your show should be great here for the next few weeks, and, and what else going on with it, Mickey? Well, you're one of the ones making these shows great. We appreciate the time, my friend. Anyone else from Clemson that we missed, by the way, or do you think we hit everybody? I think you hit everybody draftability wise. Got it. And you know, um, and, and where the program is right now, mostly defensive guys. And then, but I think you've got, you know, in, in your evaluation of it, I think you guys have a great handle on who those guys are. And and um, you know, again, like it's always a it's such a, a a big jump for everybody. And and I'm never surprised by anybody. To me, there are no there there are no um, can't misses, and there are no guys that nope. I don't totally believe in. Like it's a it's amazing the process. Of all that money, all that time spent on it, and you still make mistakes at it both ways, right? Guys, you passed on, or that's just fascinating to me that you got all that study, all that film, all the medical records, all the all the psychological stuff, psychological stuff going on, and you still make mistakes. It's one of the, how difficult it really is. One of the toughest things in the world to do, man. Predicting, it really is. And predicting what kind of football player these like nineteen year old kids yeah. are going to be when coming out of school. It's really hard. Uh, question for you on Clemson, Mickey, real quick. Have you guys found a quarterback yet? You know, great defense, but you guys have just struggled scoring yeah. points the last couple of years. I, I joke about our quarterback now. He's a great kid, first of all. He, he was a, a true sophomore last year. Uh, when he's good, he's really good. Kate Klubnick, he's from Texas. He, he played a big program there. And, and the surprising part, like with, with Trevor Lawrence and with Deshaun Watson, those, they were high-profile kids that came from great programs. This kid's a high-profile kid that came from a great program as well. So first, going back, DJ Ungalale just didn't work here. Yeah. It was it was partly his fault, partly the staff's fault. It, went, it just wasn't the right fit. Uh, he panicked. He, he he really got. He started seeing ghosts, and, and you've seen it before. Like it just didn't go very well. Uh, on on the club that kid, I keep joking around. 
he's like a Labrador puppy, man. He's excitable. He's cute. He's awesome. But he just pees on the carpet too much. You know, <laughs> he just he just makes all these these pick six throws and and scoop and score fumbles. Is like I'm getting tired of the gangly, big footed Labrador. Like let's grow into a mature dog and, and manage the game a little bit. But yeah, if they can. He's got he's got skills. I tell you what, I didn't. I don't know if I've seen this before. Like a guy's arm strength really improved this much because that was a big question out of high school. But but he's got arm talent now. Uh, good feet. If we could just get him to stop peeing on the carpet around here, Clemson should be good. I, the future's good here too. Uh, Dabo's got a program, and he's he, they've gone through a little bit of transformation through COVID. Hurt them uh, more, maybe most more folks because you got to be here. If you ever get to Clemson, come on down, guys. It's a beautiful place, and it's a it's a real attractive place. And then. Um, you know, NIL and transfer portal have hurt him a little bit. Even I think he'll emerge from that when they finally get all the rules right and, and correct. He'll emerge from that really good. I think the future is really bright around here. We're going through a little, you know, our stumbling blocks are ten and two, you know, and, and, <laughs> You're and right. finishing twelfth. You know, that's not great around here anymore. But hey, one more quick question. Hey, so you guys are on the right, you know, a playoff last a couple two years ago and uh, six or seven wins last year, but but. We keep playing the, the Commanders, by the way. Every time I watch you play the Commanders, you beat them. But, <laughs> but uh, there, there seems to be some good, good, good uh, things to build on, right? Why would you take this one, Matt? Yeah, look, there's some definitely some good building blocks the Giants have yeah. on, on both sides of the ball. The roster is, you know, not not complete, not where it needs yeah. to be. I think to be, you know, a perennial contender, a perennial playoff team. But there are definitely some very promising and strong young pieces on both sides of the ball. That's the key. Young players are new or Joe Shane is not new anymore. He's really done a good job since he's got here of building a core of young players to build around, which I think is going to take us into, you know, years to come having a pretty solid, consistent success. That's, that's amazing to me. The capology stuff, how young the league gets and then how short your windows are. Because yeah. I mean, when we talked last year, I feel like the Eagles were only going to be those like five or six year window. And then I watched them at the end of last year. I'm like, man, these guys are done. It's, a, it's just crazy how your league works and how fast. short your windows are. You know? No, Mickey, absolutely. We appreciate the time, my friend. Hey, sounds great, guys. Good luck to you guys. Thanks again. Thank Mickey you. Plyler, we thank him for joining us. Great stuff from LSU and Clemson there. And just uh, excellent, excellent stuff from both those guys uh, covering a lot of fun. Mickey's always entertaining. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you can tell he's a radio host down there. He has like the lingo going. He's he's all over it. Does a fantastic he's job. Great. Out of all the guys you talked about here, Matt, real quick, I'll ask you two questions before you goodbye. Okay. Guy or position of the two teams we talked about today, the Giants are most likely to pick in your mind. Most likely, I would have to say wide receiver. You're gonna go neighbors. From LSU okay. and neighbors. I would say one of the defensive tackles between the three guys from LSU and then the two guys from Clemson. And I think defensive tackles in need. I will go one of those five defensive tackles hey, because, I, because because I got five swings of the bat with that one <laughs> instead of just one with neighbors. Look, I would love any almost any of those defensive tackles. I think all of them, with a little bit of time and especially with some guidance from Dexter Lawrence, Raheem Nunez, Rochez, like I think and Andre those guys, Patterson for that matter. Especially Andre Patterson. Mm-hmm. I think those guys could develop into some very solid starters. But I mean, just with where the Giants are in the draft and the caliber of prospect Malik neighbors is that would, that would be my number one guess. Okay. Final question. What, where's your head at right now in terms of the draft? What are you thinking? What's your gut? And just kind of, where do you stand with the Giants? Oh, here? I go back and forth. I wouldn't even say every day. It's like every hour I go back and <laughs> forth. You know, I still think the most likely scenario, and I'm not saying this is what I want, but the most likely scenario I still think is sticking at six and picking whoever the top wide receiver is most likely Marvin Harrison or Malik neighbors. If I had to guess right now, that's what I think would happen. I still think there is a solid chance that the giants move up in order to try to get one of the quarterbacks. I think, are you at the point with like, I am, is this where I am that if they want one of those four quarterbacks, they're going to have to move up to get them. Yes, I agree. And I mean, you and I spoke about this a couple weeks ago. Joe Shane, the front office, they know a lot more about football and evaluating prospects than you and I do. Quarterbacks especially. Quarterbacks especially. If there is a guy that they are in love with at the quarterback position and he is there at, you know, pick three or pick four and those two teams are 
willing to pick up the phone and talk trade. Which might not happen, by the way, but might not. If. That's why I said if, because, yep. you know, the Patriots could easily just be like, you know what, we're sticking at three and we're taking the quarterback we want. Cause That's they're what the I would very, do if I were them. <laughs> yeah, because they're at the very <laughs> beginning of a rebuild now. So yeah. for all those fans that are saying, draft a quarterback no matter what, we need a quarterback, like, it may not be possible. You don't want to take a quarterback just for the sake of taking a quarterback because that could put you, set you back a couple years. Especially if you're trading a one next year, a day two pick this year, and then all of a sudden you can't build around that 100, quarterback. 100%. But with that said, if you know at three or four, the quarterback that the front office is absolutely in love with is there, I am all for trading whatever you need to trade to move up and get that guy. Agreed. But, again, we don't know exactly what the front office is thinking. That's nope. a good thing that we have no idea what they're thinking. And it's a good thing that we're not making those decisions either. Yes. And we're just too dope sitting at a table giving our We opinions. just get to talk yes. about it. Exactly. But I, <laughs> me and you are – we need to talk about this for the show. We are 1,000% um, on the same page right there. Matt, good stuff, my friend. Thank you. And he right mentioned, back at you. And he mentioned mock drafts and stuff like that. Well, draft season, the most recent episode is up. We did a mock draft. Marvin Harrison Jr. fell to the Giants at five, by the way. You had four quarterbacks, one through four. Chargers took Joe Alt. And by the way, that's not impossible. No. Like, it's not something that's out of the question. So go check that out on Draft Season, our podcast. You can find it at Giants.com, Giants Mobile app, Giants.com slash podcast. And, of course, I haven't did this in a while, so I should do it. Giants TV is the Giants uh, streaming uh, video mobile television app. You can find all our video content and stuff like that. It's for free. Amazon TV, Roku, all those different things. Check it out. Uh, again, Giants TV, all the original video content, all that stuff. And if you want Giant tickets, season tickets, whatever you're looking for, go to Giants.com slash tickets. You can take your fans to the next level with a season ticket membership. Stay connected to the club all year round. Uh, memberships are now available for the 2024 season. Learn more all about the exclusive member benefits. Giants.com slash tickets. For Matt Sytek, I'm John Schmuck. We'll see you next time, everybody.